Okay, we are at the top of the hour, so that means we are going to get started. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We're going to be going through year-end depreciation with Sage Fixed Assets. A few quick housekeeping items to review. We'll do about a 45-minute presentation, and then we'll save some time at the end for your questions. Uh, please type your questions into the question box. It should be to the right of your screen to submit them and send them throughout the presentation as you think of them. And then, of course, after the webinar is done, we will send you a copy of the slide deck as well as a recording of the presentation in an email um, tomorrow. So before we get started, just to introduce you to your presenters, I am Kelly Jacobs, your Vice President of Customer Success here at BrainCell. I will be your host today, and we are joined by our longtime colleague and the engineer Sage Fixed Assets and Sage Fixed Assets uh, expert extraordinaire, Wayne Austin. Welcome, Wayne. Thank you, Kelly. Again, thanks for joining us, everyone. Just to give you a quick overview of what we will be covering uh, today. So today, we're going to take a look at uh, the Sage Fix Asset Solution and how that can help you get through your urine processes more efficiently. But first, I want to take a quick uh, look and compare uh, with Excel, for example, for those of you that might be still uh, doing your fixed asset depreciation in Excel versus what you can get out of a solution like Sage Fix Asset. Of course, with any investment, you know, you want to see what is the value of really uh, using that tool. So I'm also going to take a look at that perspective, whether or not it's worth uh, investing in a fixed asset management solution like the Sage Fixed Assets. I'm going to share some information about what value uh, this tool uh, brings you and uh, give you a complete uh, overview of what uh, components make up the Sage Fixed Asset Solution. Since uh, this webinar is also focused on year end, I'm going to spend some time and share with you some resources that are available uh, from Sage. And uh, Kelly will share some information about what resources are available to help you at year end uh, from BrainCell. So you'll have uh, both sides of the picture there. Also, I want to talk a bit about uh, integration. So for those of you that are using specifically Sage 100, Sage 300, or Sage Intact, so you can see what integration is available between those products and Sage Fixed Asset Solution. I will uh, have some time to go in and actually show you the solution, but I'll have to keep this at a fairly uh, high level, you know, based on time. But certainly, if any of you decide you'd like to see a, more, a deeper dive to the solution, just be sure to reach out to Kelly, and she can uh, arrange a one-on-one -on -one, uh, demonstration uh, with myself and your team. Now, we'll also be leaving some time for Q&A, so definitely uh, you do not have to wait until the end to ask questions. You can actually type them uh, in uh, the chat in the questions so that uh, it's top of mind. You know, you can certainly bring uh, that thought up or question that you might have, and during the Q&A, we will go back and review all of the questions uh, that you might have. And at the end, uh, of course, uh, Kelly will come back on and talk about uh, next steps. So first, let's take a look uh, at the differences between uh, doing your fixed asset depreciation versus uh, using the Sage fixed asset solutions. Now, of course, using Excel, you know, most of you are going to be pretty Excel savvy, so you feel that uh, you know you can get uh, quite a bit of information in there. But some of the challenges you're going to have is uh, data integrity, or if you're a part of a team with multiple users. How do you control access? Who can, uh, you know, for example, uh, do disposals? Uh, who's handling uh, the various calculations? So there could be some challenges with your formula calculations, especially if you are doing tax. What happens when tax will changes? For example, if you're doing uh, bonus uh, depreciation, but you have vehicles, for example, how do you enforce the vehicle limits? In the case of uh, Let's say a vehicle that's on 75,000. If you have an asset placed in service uh, using property type A, as an example, placed in service in 2021, 
under IRS rules, even with 100% bonus, you're only allowed to take 18,200 uh, that first year on that asset. So you would be reliant on the person doing the calculation in Excel to make sure that they are aware of what the rules uh, actually allow for access placing service under those conditions. Um, there's little or no error detection in uh, Excel spreadsheets, and certainly the audit trail is going to be pretty limited in what you can get out of that. Whereas with the Sage Fixed Asset Solution has excellent uh, data integrity, you have pretty uh, granular user access control. So for example, you can limit who can set or clear period closes. Uh, you can limit who can perform disposals or transfers. It does have a pretty uh, well-defined uh, history tab that captures all changes going on with the asset, but it also has Sarbanes-Oxley compliant reporting. So you can look uh, across multiple companies, for example, to see who has changed what, who has changed acquisition values, depreciation methods, lives, and so on, where you would have none of that type of capability within an Excel spreadsheet. Tax rules, of course, are built in and enforced. So in the case that I mentioned, for example, with uh, an automobile placed in service, the system will enforce the vehicle limits for uh, luxury automobiles or light trucks, for example, those tables are built into the system. Now let's take a look at what is some of the business value you get out of that. So as I mentioned, it's going to help you maintain uh, compliance with IRS uh, tax laws and uh, GAAP rules. It does integrate with our SAGE ERP system. So if you are using SAGE 100, 300 or ATT&CK, it does integrate with those uh, solutions. It's going to ensure that you get clean and accurate data, which of course is going to help you on the reporting side of things make sure you're getting accurate reports out of that. Now, one of the important uh, you know, aspects of managing uh, fixed assets is being able to identify and eliminate ghost or zombie assets. So ghost assets, uh, as you know, are assets that you're carrying in your registry, but they're not in service, cannot be found, they've been lost, uh, stolen, or otherwise discarded. But however, the accounting team is not aware of that, so you're still uh, continuing to carry those on the book. So, of course, those have uh, financial implications. The same would be true of zombie assets where someone has made some purchases of assets, they're placed in service, but you have no awareness uh, of that. One of the challenges you could have with that, for example, if you have additional uh, IT assets computers, for example, you may not have the correct number of licenses, so putting the company at risk there. So being able to identify ghosts and zombie assets will help you eliminate overpayments of taxes uh, and insurance premiums. Uh, having a good solution like Sage Fix Assets in place is also going to save time, because as you know, time uh, equates to dollars. It's going to help you with uh, disaster recovery or business continuity, because you can easily uh, get back up and running with your backups of the company, for example, or uh, the fact that you're able to attach uh, or link images, invoices, and so on. If one of your uh, locations gets damaged or destroyed, you can easily prove what you had at that location, what was its value, and certainly if you're linking uh, images and invoices, the condition uh, that they were in. As I mentioned uh, previously, it does include uh, Solvames uh, Oxley compliant reports. So you're easily able to provide that type of information uh, to auditors if needed. Now, let's look at the financial uh, aspect of this. <clears throat> if you go on the Sage Fixed Assets website, there's actually an ROI calculator where you can plug in the numbers for your particular uh, company. The example I have here, by the way, does not factor in any savings you'll gain from uh, time efficiency in saving time uh, at year end, for example, but it does factor in uh, what you can expect to save by just eliminating uh, ghost assets. Now, this ROI calculator example that I'm using, if you take a look at the top right uh, portion here, you'll see I'm using just a modest value of 5 million for the total cost of my assets in my particular example here. And I'm using a 15% as the percentage 
of a ghost assets in this particular uh, company and a remaining value of 40%, so they're partially uh, depreciated. So if you look at the total cost of ghost assets in that scenario, we're using 5 million for the total cost of my assets, that equates to 750,000. And the remaining value uh, equates to 300,000. Now using a 21% uh, federal uh, tax level, that can result in a potential overpayment of 63,000. And for state, and I know that may not apply to everyone, but I'm just using uh, my state uh, here, for example, which is 6%, and uh, that translates to 18,000. Now, overpayment on property taxes, this could result in, in this case, to 10,200. And for insurance premium, using 0.01% of 7,500. So in this modest example, you're looking at a potential of 98,700 in uh, first year savings. Now let's take a look at the various components in uh, the fixed asset solution. Now, the fixed asset, the Sage fixed asset solution is comprised of a planning module for handling CIP or projects, tracking module uh, for handling physical inventory, depreciation module uh, for handling all of your depreciation requirements and customer reporting. So if we first take a look at the planning module, what this will allow you to do is handle all of your CIP or work in project, progress type projects uh, where you can manage all of the costs associated. So these would be roll of costs from various uh, transactions that might be coming out of your AP or PO systems for materials, labor, and so on. And the end result being some item or piece of equipment uh, being placed in service that you will later need to be able to depreciate. This uh, particular module will allow you to manage all of the costs associated with those projects. So if you look at the graphic on the right, you can see I can actually monitor my actual spend on the project against both an original and a revised budget. And by the way, once any item is ready to be placed in service coming out of the planning module, these items can be sent directly to the depreciation module, so no duplicate entry there and they can be placed in service ready to start depreciation. The tracking module. <clears throat> this module is what's gonna tie back directly uh, to what I just showed you in the ROI calculator, because this is a tool that's gonna to allow you to identify ghost and zombie assets. So you will be able to use either an Android app or a traditional handheld scanner where you can have uh, those users go out and conduct a physical inventory by attaching barcode labels with the corresponding asset ID numbers to all of your fixed assets. Now, the users that are using an Android app or a traditional handheld scanner, those users do not require a license. So if you have a three user package, for example, those three users would be the ones that are actually using the tracking software the user is using an Android app or a handheld scanner, they're more on the passive side because they would be receiving the inventory list from the tracking module users, and they can then go off site and actually scan those barcode, update any information that's changed. Now, a couple of things to note here with the tracking module. It does use the same database as the depreciation module, and I'll actually show you that when we go into the demonstration. But however, these users will not have access to any of your depreciation book fields. So for example, they cannot make changes to whatever your depreciation methods you're doing for tax, for GAAP, and so on, because in the tracking module, they will not have access to any of these fields. Now the depreciation module, this is the heart of the system. It includes currently 52 uh, built-in depreciation methods. So you can handle everything from uh, ADS depreciation of makers with or without bonus, straight line amortization, and so on, and as well as declining balance. You can also create custom depreciation methods. In the current release, you can have up to 20 depreciation books. So that means for each asset in the system, you can have 20 different depreciation methods or values for that same asset in the system. 
The solution also includes an audit advisor that you can run at any point throughout the year, which again, this particular tool is something that will help with your end because that way you can identify any potential issues and take corrective action before your year end. So if you are working with an auditor, for example, at year end, you can really clean things up significantly before engaging with that auditor. Now, there are 30 standard reports included in uh, the solution. And these would include things like an actual file of 4562, as well as the detail attachment that you would need with that 4562. It also includes a tax expense report, which you would use to reconcile uh, the 4562. It also includes uh, a 4797 sale of property report, as well as property tax reports, uh, other standard reports, such as your depreciation expense, uh, your journal entry, and a roll forward report uh, in the form of a fixed asset summary report. I will go through all of these reports in the demonstration so you'll be able to see what type of information does get captured uh, in these reports. Now, natively in the system, as I mentioned, there's 30 standard reports. In the standard version of the solution, <clears throat> you are able to sort the reports by any uh, fields that you choose to so I could sort and subtotal by location, class, and so on. What the custom reporting feature adds, it gives you the ability to add or remove columns of data in the systems, but will also give you a fully integrated version of SAP Crystal Reports so that you can actually build any type of ad hoc report from scratch. This will give you the ability to add SQL expressions, formulas, graphs, and so on. So literally, it gives you unlimited reporting capability. Now let's talk a bit about uh, integration with Stage 100, 300, and N. Now, with Stage 100 and Stage 300, two-way integration is available. You will be able to actually create assets from an AP or PO transactions, and in the case of Stage 100, it will actually pull the journal entry directly from the fixed asset depreciation. So let's take a look at the AP side first. So if you take a look at the right graphic towards the bottom, you'll notice that there's an asset template there. So what that means is while doing an AP transaction, I can populate all of the cost information, geo information, and so on. But before I tell it to place this item in service in the depreciation module, I also have the ability to assign a template, and these templates are created in the depreciation module. So what that means for you is if you do place items in service coming out of stage 100 or stage 300 and you tell it to apply a template and in your template you're defining the depreciation method and estimated life for that type of asset, you could literally place things in service that you don't have to touch any further in the depreciation module because you have the ability to have it applied the correct depreciation methods and estimated life for all your depreciation. So again, another time saving there. With Sage 100, as I mentioned, Sage 100 will actually pull the journal entry information from Sage for example. So literally all you would need to do is run depreciation at month end, and that information that you would normally need to export from a journal entry file, Sage 100 has the ability to pull that data directly from the Sage for Access depreciation model. Just a couple of screen captures from inside of Sage 100. In the case of Sage 300, it uses a posting link where it's going to actually format the information and post it directly over to Sage 100, it's over to Sage 300. If you do have multiple legal entities, by the way, in Sage 3, uh, with the Sage 300 posting link, you're able to select which legal entity you want to post the journal entry form and send that information over to SAGE 300. In the case of SAGE Intact, there's also a posting link uh, to SAGE Intact. And for those of you that might be using dimension mapping, you can configure your dimension map and it will actually save, save that. So it will then format the 
report for your journal entry in the manner that Sage Intact needs it and post it out to a CSV file that can then be imported in Sage Intact. Now, a big change is coming uh, down uh, the roadmap for this. We are going to be uh, changing this configuration that it will actually post to Sage Intact through the API, so no longer needing to actually push out a file. It will actually post this information directly into Sage Intact, and that is coming in the near future. Additionally, with regards to Sage Intel, the plan is to uh, update that once they've changed to the API format, is to later then make it uh, available for two-way integration. So we will keep you posted on when that will happen. For a quick look from the Sage Intact side, once the information is posted, you can go into your Sage Intact journals and process that journal entry. Now let's take a look at some of the year and resources available from SAGE and later on uh, Kelly will fill you in on some of the year and resources available from BrainSoft. So on the SAGE Fix Us at the website we do have some on-demand webinars available and these are posted, some of these are posted uh, by myself. These are webinars I may have done. There are some that are created by Sage University, our learning services group. So it's a good way of getting some refresher information on how to perform different functions or looking at different functionality in Sage fixed assets. And especially with regards to um, new features that may come out in uh, updated uh, releases. There's also Sage City. So for those of you that are currently using uh, Sage 100 or 300, for example, if you go out to the year end center, this is where you can get information that might be posted by customers like yourselves or partners or my Sage colleagues. So there's a lot of great articles, knowledge base, and so on available out on Sage City. It's a collaborative environment. But this is also where you can vote on upcoming feature enhancements you'd like to see in the product. Other resources available out on Sage City is you have the ability to use a year end checklist for Sage fixed assets. And you can actually download that year end checklist as an interactive PDF. And you can certainly uh, customize this for your particular workflow. So if you have a team of several people, using a year end checklist is a great way of really ensuring that everyone uh, is on the same page and up to speed on where things uh, are currently. Now let's take a moment and go into the solution so we can see what some of that functionality is. Now I'm currently in the planning module. You can have multiple projects going and I'm gonna go ahead and go into one of my projects and as you can see that graphic that I showed you earlier in the presentation, where you can easily see what's spent or unspent of the budget, what's capitalized and what's expense, and you can view your actual spend against both an original and a revised budget. So if you have multiple projects going within each of the projects, you have the ability to set an original as well as a revised budget and any other project related information that you want to capture, including your start and end date, project codes, and so on. Now, the reason I want to bring this up for those of you that do have, you know, recurring projects or some type of CIP uh, process uh, going on, part of your year end, right? Even if the project is not complete, is if there are line items that are ready to be placed in service, then you'll want to go ahead and get those placed in service so that they can start depreciating in current uh, year so that that depreciation expense and accumulated depreciation can get factored in. Now, in our planning module, you don't have to wait until the project is complete to go ahead and create assets. So if we take a look at one of my online item details here, you'll see that I can easily capture a budget for that independent line item. I can also have a revised budget for that. I have some fields I can customize and capture information I want to uh, about uh, these line items, but I can also link fields here so that when I place anything in service uh, coming out of 
a, a project, I can actually link these fields to any of my general information fields in the appreciation module. So that's an important thing if I want to capture some type of CR number, AP numbers, you know, who approved that budget information and so on, I can do that. Now the transactions that I mentioned, all of the very uh, roll up cost, you can capture all of that information here. These, by the way, can be imported from Excel. So if you are exporting, if you're able to export these onto an Excel file coming out of your AP system, uh, all of those accumulated costs, these can be captured in the planning module. It'll keep a running total of your spend against the budget for that line item. And let me go back to my main list view. So if you look at this view where you're looking at all of the items in the project, each of these individual line items is what's actually going to become uh, a fixed asset. And those transactions, as I mentioned, are what going to become your total spend for this line item. And it will measure your total spend, in my case, 23,937 here, against my budget for this line item. Now there's an asset information tab. This is where I can tell it when spending is complete, I can set my completion date and even set a placed in service date. And if you create a template in the depreciation module, these are asset templates, I can tell it to apply a template, but I can also even split a single line item into multiple assets of equal or different values. Now, once I've told it spending is complete, it's going to actually change the status of that line item. So if you look at my status column here, anything with a status of C like Charlie simply means I've gone here and told it spending is complete, and I've set my place in service date and so on. <clears throat> anything with an S like Sam has already been sent to the depreciation module of the place in service, and A is still just an active line item where spending is still in progress. All I have to do to actually tell it to create assets in the depreciation modules is go to line items, select create assets, and it's going to show me each line item where spending is complete. I can select all, I can place all of these uh, assets in service in a single company, or I can simply use my shift key or a control key and place them in service and other companies. So I do have the flexibility of when I create these assets and I can create all, or I can create them independently of each other. It will show you how many assets will be created. So if you remember my building signs that I showed you, that is going to be split into four assets. The rest of these will be a single line item. And when you actually tell it to create these assets, it will actually generate a report showing you uh, what was successfully created. Now, of course, reporting is important uh, here as well. So I can easily run a variety of reports. So if I wanted to look at, for example, a consolidated report looking at multiple projects, I can simply choose the projects I want to see, and I can view this information in subtotals or detail level where I can easily see what my spend is against budget, or if I need to see at a detail level where I can see things like my actual spend against budget, more detail, I can view this information in either way. If I need to see something like a transaction detail, where I just want to see, let's say, what did I spend the last 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and so on, I can easily generate a report like that. And all the reports, of course, are exportable to multiple formats in all the modules. So I can push these out to a PDF, Excel, CSV file, and so on. So there are many export options. Now let's take a quick look at the tracking module, because the other thing you'll want to do before year end, year end, of course, is conduct a complete fiscal inventory. So you can easily make sure that you have what you're supposed to have. And that they are in fact where they're supposed to be. So if you take a look at the asset details, you can see here 
my general information fields. These shield fields are shared with the depreciation modules, but you'll notice there's no access to book depreciation fields. So the user of the tracking module would be using this for conducting those physical inventories, scanning those barcode labels, and updating anything that was changed. Once the inventory is complete, what's going to be important to the folks on the accounting side is the fact that they're going to be able to generate a reconciliation report. So I'm just going to run this for the last inventory I completed, since there wouldn't be time to actually do this on a short uh, presentation like this. Where in my reconciliation report, it's showing me the asset tag number, everything with a status of N, where items that were not found. I can see the tag number, what it is, and these are your ghost assets. So this is what's going to be most important for the folks on the accounting side, <clears throat> because now you have a defined list of everything that is missing, and you can then do a disposal after any gain losses and get them off the books. The tracking module does not have the ability to do disposals, but they are the ones that can notify you, hey, we conducted an inventory of site X, these are the items that were missing. It'll also capture anything found with no changes as well as anything found with changes. But for the accounting team, this is what's most important, those assets that were not found. Now let's take a look at the depreciation module so we can look at all of the uh, important features you'll need to do here. That's gonna help you with your end. Now, first off, as I mentioned, from the planning module, you can easily place things in service here. So let's take a look at how you would see them. So in my list view, there are groups and anything sent over from the planning module will actually create a group with a, that just says planning with a date and timestamp. So if I send one item over or 100 items over, they're going to show up in that group. Now, if I place these items in service coming out of CIP and did not tell it to use a template, it would actually default to personal property. It would have the acquisition date and in-service date coming from the planning module, as well as the acquisition value, which would be equal to your total spend on that item. But it would set your depreciation method to do not depreciate. So there would be no depreciation method, no estimated life. But in my case, because I told it to use a template, my template is defining the property type depreciation methods and estimate applied for all my depreciation books. So keep that in mind. So it does uh, actually save you uh, some time. Now, let's take a look at tax rule changes and how you can see what the current tax rule changes are in the release that you're using. If you go to help, it's going to give you a quick overview of any feature changes or tactical changes in the current release. So the last update I did simply had um, feature enhancements, and this is the mid-year release. Our tax update comes out in January. If you click on learn more, I can go back to that previous release from January, where I can now see these are the tax extenders that were passed and released in, a, in the 2021 release. If you're doing bonus depreciation, I can, for example, look up the tables regarding bonus depreciation. And as you can see, the future year phase offs are included here. If I wanted to go back and look at things uh, like section 179, I can see the tables governing that. So you can see what's changed for 2021. And as I mentioned, things like uh, vehicle limits are included and enforced in the system. And as I mentioned earlier, as it's placed in service in 2020 or later, your limit is 18,200, and that would actually be enforced in the system. So think of this as a quick reference, saves you having to go out to the IRS website and having to take a look at uh, what's changed there. If you take a look at asset details, as I mentioned, in the tracking module, they're not able to see these depreciation books that is solely available in the depreciation module. Methods include makers plus bonus, section 179, and there are actually some great tools to help you manage it. 
So if you've been placing as and service throughout the year and you don't decide whether or not you're going to be doing bonus for that year, you have a one six day allowance tool where I can turn bonus depreciation off or on. I can change my bonus percentage for asset and place in service in any fiscal year. So it does give you the ability to make changes. You can easily uh, do that. Uh, you also have the ability to make mass changes. So if, for example, tax rule change, such as the CARES Act that came out uh, last year, <clears throat> you're able to come in and, for example, make changes to multiple depreciation books at once, and you can change depreciation methods from anything to anything else. So in the case of the CARES Act changes, for example, you could take those 39-year assets and depreciate my straight line half year. So I could change both the depreciation methods and estimated life at the same time in that scenario. So it'll make easy to make changes to take advantage of uh, tax rule changes. And when making changes like that, I can decide do I want to change the past and go back to the place in service state, or do I want to not change the past and make a change for my current depreciation through me going forward? And for those of you that uh, again are doing tax, um, there is a mid-quarter test you can run if you do need to change from half year to mid-quarter based on IRS rules, if you've exceeded 40% place in service uh, in. Uh, the current and, and Q4 of the current uh, tax year, I can easily make it as a global change from half year to mid quarter. So you do have great tools right on the tax side of things. And for those of you that may be doing a bonus in section 179, the audit advisor tool that I mentioned, let me go ahead and run this for a previous year where you can see what type of uh, issues uh, this may capture. So in my sample data here, I went back to 2018 because that's where I know I have some uh, self-inflicted wounds, some things that are not correct. So you can see here when I run it for that tax year, it is capturing the fact that I have a makers related issue, it's generating an exception, it's telling me what the issue is, it's recommending a resolution, and it's going to create a group by this name for any asset that are triggering that exception will show up in that group. Here you can see I have a section 179 issue, and it's telling me specifically what the limit was for that year. In this case, it was 1 million, and it's telling me to correct this issue. I need to reduce my 179 expense by more than 5 million. And again, here is the group created. So if I simply go back to my list view and look at my groups list, I'll now see those auto created groups. If I take a look at the makers issue, those are the two assets creating that. Uh, exception. And for 179, all of these assets are the ones triggering that exception. So if I look at this individually, you'll see in this case, I'm taking 679k in 179 expense. And on the others, I'm taking 700k. So to correct the issue, I can reduce my 179 expense. And once I've corrected all of the issues identified, I can delete those auto created groups. I can rerun that audit advisor and if everything comes up clean, I'm good to go. All right, now let's go back and take a look at a couple of other things with the asset details here I want to point out. As I mentioned, you can link images, invoices. Basically, if you can scan it or take a picture of it, you can link. And the asset history, as I mentioned, will capture everything from asset creation through disposal. So if I were to dispose of uh, any of these assets uh, today, let's take a look at what gets captured, and then we'll take a look at the disposal report. I can dispose of the asset. It does not have to be current date. I can do sale, abandonment, uh, tax of exchange, whatever type of disposal I need to. And in the case of doing a full disposal, we'll ignore this partial option for now. So let's say I'm going to do a disposal here by sale. I'll throw into cash proceeds, maybe some expense of sale, calculate my gain loss, and you'll see it'll calculate the gain losses across all my depreciation books. I can actually defer recognizing this for an individual uh, book. But if you notice my gain losses are different, that's because in this case, for tax, I'm doing bonus depreciation at 50%. I'm doing gap 
straight line. And for state, I'm doing make for the non bonus. So I have different methods, different lives, and you can even have different values between the depreciation books. So that's why the differences in that book values in my particular scenario. Now you'll see it's populated a full disposal, even though this is an asset that I've previously done several partial disposals. So if you notice those previous partial disposals were at varying amounts. And so we'll go back and look at how you would do a partial disposal in a moment. When you do a full disposal, you'll see that all of the depreciation books will be grayed out. And if you take a look at the uh, asset history, you'll see here that it was disposed and it will show the date on the system separate from the actual disposal date. Okay. Now, if you make a mistake, you can reverse these transactions either full or partial. So let's take a look at that. I can simply go back to my transactions tab delete last transactions, the previous transactions are untouched. Everything goes back to the current values, but the asset history is not erased, right? It simply creates a new entry that that transaction was reversed when it was done and who did it. Now, in the case of a partial disposal, and I'll go ahead and choose uh, a different asset here. This one you'll see has a previous partial disposal of 10,000, but I still have 135K that's continuing to depreciate. So I can simply come in and I'll just go ahead and do this by abandonment. But now I'm gonna say yes here, this is the partial disposal and just hit tab and uh, enter the value of that portion that I'm going to uh, be disposing. You can actually enter a description. So that way, if you have multiple partial disposals, you can know what you did at that point. It's gonna reduce your acquisition value across the board by that disposal amount. I'll go ahead and say okay here. And you'll see it's added a second transaction, my previous $10,000 partial disposal, my current partial disposal. And you'll notice that my depreciation books are still active. They're not grayed out and my acquisition values have all been reduced by the disposal amount. That also does get captured uh, here. So if you take a look in the history tab, you can see the asset was partially disposed, but now it's also gonna show you what your depreciation book values change from and to for all of your depreciation books. And yes, you can reverse partial transactions as well. Okay. Now let's take a look at running depreciation and some of the um, reports that you will need, including the journal entry. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a look at what the disposal report looks like, because certainly that's one of the reports you're gonna need uh, for your end. You can run this for any date range you want. You can sort and subtotal it in any way you choose as well. But I'm just going to run this unsorted for right now. This is the report that will capture all of your net proceeds, realized gain losses from your disposals for whatever date range you choose to run this for. But this will capture both full and partial disposals. It'll capture your system number, which is automatically assigned by the software, your asset ID number which is user defined. So this would be your asset tax, what it is, your in-service date and your disposal date. Under acquired value, think of this really as your disposal amount, because if you look at these two laptops, these were a full disposal, it's gonna be the full acquisition value. If you take a look at the system number 14, uh, 416, where you see I have three entries for that same line item, that was the Volvo truck I showed you earlier that had three previous partial disposals one for a $10,000 portion, a $15,000 portion, and a $12,000 portion. It will also capture your accumulated depreciations, your net proceeds, your realized gain losses, anything deferred or not recognized. And again, all of these reports are exportable. 
So let's go ahead and run depreciation. So I will go ahead and run this for all my assets. And I'll run depreciation for November. I can tell it to run my depreciation expense report at the same time, but I'm not gonna do that right now. Because I actually wanna go into the asset details and show you some things. If you take a look at this list view, I can choose by the way what information is available here. Okay. I can change how it's sorted. I can also tell it to auto sum numeric fields. Okay. Now, if I take a look at any of my asset details, you'll also see in the calculated data down below, my prior depreciation through date, current through date, depreciation run, net book value, and so on. So now let's go and take a look at your report section and run some of these reports that you will need for your end. Now I'm gonna run the depreciation expense report. As I mentioned, you can sort and subtotal this in any way you choose. You can add or remove columns of data. But let's just look at the standard version of this report and what information is captured. This is one of the reports that is now uh, depreciation date dependent. So it will look at both your prior through date and current through date, as well as your depreciation this month. You see here, my prior through date, current through date. So in my case, my depreciation this run is working at one month will capture all of your totals on the last page, less than a disposals or transfers, acquired value, what you're doing for bonus, 168 or 179, your basis, current accumulated depreciation, and so on. For your journal entry, let's go ahead and run the standard report so you can get a better look at what will actually get captured and that so that when you use the uh, integration, this is the information that will be sent over to Sage 100, Sage 300, and Sage Intact. So here's a standard version of the journal entry report. You can certainly run this, export this. So even if you're not using a Sage ERP, you still have the ability uh, to export this, for example, to a CSV file. For those of you that are using Sage 100, or say 300 and the lengths you can configure whichever of those systems you are using as your favorites. So in the case of Sage 100, we'll actually pull that data from the depreciation module Sage 300, hosting link will send it out. Let's take a look at the Sage and TAC link because I just wanted to show you real quick how you would configure those dimensions. So if you have multiple legal entities, you can choose which company you want to run this for for your internal book. And, and the settings is where you can configure those dimensions. So if I preview this version of the file, you will see that as opposed to the previous version I showed you, it is now laying it out with those dimensions that you select. And when you hit post, it's gonna format this file and output it uh, for Sage and Tech. With the API link that's coming down the road, as I mentioned, when you Post it, it's actually going to send it as opposed to putting it out to a CSV file. It's going to actually post it directly to Sage Intact through that API. So let's get ahead and go back. And because there are a few other reports we want to make sure we take a quick look at, and then I will uh, go back so we can do some QA. Uh, as I mentioned, you can generate your actual fileable 4562. And when you are depreciated, Run this for my 2020. When you're depreciated to your actual uh, fiscal year end, it will generate both the actual file of 4562 and the detail um, attachment that goes along with this. And as I mentioned, you can also run the tax expense report which will, of course, capture your totals for 160 to 179. And that's the report you would actually use 
to reconcile the 4562. There is also a sale of property report. So this would be your 4797 worksheet. And you can certainly run this. So even if you are using an outside CPA firm, you can still run these reports, send this data off to them. And of course, this will break everything down to your 1245, 1250 property and capture all of your federal ordinary gain losses. Here's other standard reports, such as a net low value report, our low four report, which is another common report that most people will need. And this will actually capture your beginning cost, ending cost, uh, acquisitions, transfers, and disposal all in one report. But it will also capture your prior accumulated and total accumulated depreciation as well. And as I mentioned, all of these reports are exportable to multiple formats. All right, so let's take a moment and see if we have uh, some questions here. We do, we have some good questions actually. Um, first of all, thank you Wayne for walking us through um, Sage Fixed Assets. Um, all right, so first, Question up is regarding the module. So the um, pla uh, excuse me, the tracking planning um, are all of those included, or am I able to just get the modules that I need? Oh sure. So as I mentioned, the fake Sage Fixed Asset Solution gives you the ability to manage assets through their complete life cycle. So in that scenario, if you do have CIP. Uh, you do physical inventories as well as depreciation, then you would get all the modules. But certainly not everyone has uh, a need for uh, the planning module. For example, you may not have any CIP. So you can absolutely get just a single module. You can get depreciation only, you can get depreciation and tracking, depreciation and planning, and so on. So you do not have to get all the modules. You can get a single module. Okay, good to know. Yeah, you can mix and match. Um, let's see, we have another one here, and um, I believe you had mentioned this also, that um, Sage Fixed Assets doesn't necessarily only work with the Sage accounting software. That's correct? That's correct. So if you're using uh, another uh, ERP system, uh, you can actually, uh, in most cases, in those systems, you can import from a CSV or standard Excel format. So you can certainly export your reports and import them. But if you need some type of custom integration or automation, you know, like some larger organizations might need, uh, custom integration is a bit. Perfect. Um, just a couple more here. Um, oh, this one I can answer, actually. Who can help with integration configuration with Stage 100? That would be brain cell. So whomever it is that you work on the technical side, um, as far as your upgrades or anything like that um, would be the same team who could help you get this implemented uh, to integrate with your Sage ERP. And finally, um, we've got a question. Is this a cloud application? Is this uh, deployed in the cloud? Okay, great question. So this is an on-premise solution. So it's a client server. So uh, you can run this on a virtual machine, so it does support uh, VMware and so on. But however, you can certainly have this hosted. So if you're working with a hosting provider actually your own, or if you're having this hosted uh, you know, through a uh, brain cell, uh, you can certainly do that. But there are definitely uh, options for hosting this where you can access it completely remotely. Excellent. And this was actually not a question that was asked, but something that I thought of just now, um, just so everyone is aware to fixed assets is offered as an annual or monthly subscription. So just a little FYI there. Uh, I think that does it for the questions, but folks, if you think of any others, please don't be shy. Go ahead and put them in the chat box there. And if not, um, you can always reach out to me if you have any other questions or uh, anything like that. And finally, I want to thank you all again for joining us this afternoon. Um, 
Just a quick couple of notes here, uh, like Wayne mentioned, I would be reviewing. So we do offer help with closing out your year end. Um, any kind of help you need there. If system upgrades are required, we are currently getting those scheduled right now. Um, we have just sent out a message the other day to our Sage 100 customers regarding 1099. So that is something that if you are on version 2019 and you are below system pack five, we'll need to get you updated in order to process 1099 if you're not doing them manually. And uh, there's our contact information there at the bottom. So feel free to screenshot that. And uh, yeah, we're here to help guys. So thank you again. And thank you, Wayne, very much for joining us today and giving us the wonderful presentation of Sage Fixed Assets. My pleasure.